Welcome back, everybody, for our second panel uh, this morning on urban education. Uh, our panelists, our very distinguished panelists from all over the globe, once again, will be speaking on innovative approaches to education. Uh, that is a tall order, I know, because we all like to think of ourselves as innovative. Um, not being innovative, I think, is the kiss of death in our society these days. And uh, yet, we've managed to put together a panel where all men on this panel, so I can say gentlemen, where the gentlemen are, in fact, true innovators in education. We're going to begin our discussion this morning with Eric Nadelstern. Um, Eric is from New York City and currently the Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Support and Instruction for New York City's Department of Education. He oversees instructional and operational support to the city's 1,500 schools. When I say 1,500 schools in the United States, that's a very, very big number. But after listening to New Delhi and Shanghai, I'm afraid, Eric, you're outnumbered here. You're not the biggest school system uh, at, our, at our panel or at our conference. Among his many positions that he's held in the New York City public schools, uh, they include Chief school, Schools Officer of the Division of School Support, Chief Executive Officer of Empowerment Schools, which has been one of the extraordinary innovations in American public school education. And I think uh, all of our global education leaders will learn a lot from Eric in this context. He's supervising, super, he'd been supervising superintendent for the autonomy zone. And uh, importantly to many people in this audience, he was a principal. In fact, he was a founding principal of the International High School at LaGuardia Community College and created an extraordinary, innovative public secondary school for English language learners. Many of you, I know, have to deal with the question of um, multiculturalism and multiple languages in your school system. So I hope, I imagine everybody will bang down your door after this. Um, Eric is also the author of many, many articles and books on public education and because of establishing school-based autonomy as a school district reform strategy, he is somebody who is invited all over the world to speak about what he's been doing in New York City. Um, I just have to say from a personal note, uh, we in the city of New York are really lucky to have Eric as part of our school reform efforts and as a very important member of our school leadership team. Uh, welcome to Columbia University and the Global Partners Summit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Esther, for that uh, very generous uh, and warm introduction. Uh, it is not often uh, that someone in a position such as mine gets to travel from the Bronx to Manhattan and be introduced as um, uh, an important figure in global education. Uh, so this is a, a particularly uh, 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 nice place for me to be this morning. By a show of hands, can... Um, can I see how many uh, people in the audience work for the New York City Public Schools? So I'm going to keep my remarks brief so that you can all get back to work because uh, <laughs> last time I looked, the kids were there this morning. Um, every organization is perfectly designed to achieve uh, the outcomes uh, that it gets. When I began uh, as a student in the New York City public schools in the middle of the 20th century, uh, half of all the students in the New York City public schools graduated from high school. Of course, in the middle of the 20th century, even if you didn't graduate from high school, uh, you could get a job in a factory, perhaps uh, one of the automakers or closer to home Grumman on Long Island. You could work the line for 40 hours a week uh, and uh, perhaps put in some overtime and expect to own your own home, have a car on the driveway, uh, send a child or two to college. Uh, and those days are over in the United States. 
having a high school diploma is baseline uh, for full participation uh, in the political and economic life of this country and probably insufficient. Uh, it's about having a high school diploma and graduating with the opportunity at some form of post-secondary education. When I began teaching two decades later in the New York City public schools, uh, the graduation rate remained 50 percent, one out of every two students. When I opened the International High School at LaGuardia Community College, uh, the graduation rate was still 50 percent. At the start of the Bloomberg Klein administration in 2002, the graduation rate was still 50 percent. It had remained flat in this city for more than half a century. Half of all the students who attended our schools uh, never graduated from high school. Um, so one of the first things the mayor did uh, upon uh, being elected was uh, he declared that education would be his priority and in fact placed the Department of Education right behind City Hall where it is today uh, so that um, he could um, both keep an eye on what was going on, but also uh, shape the policies that were to come. Second thing he did, and I think it's little understood, is he didn't scour the country to find the best teacher uh, to lead what is now a $23 billion organization. Uh, he hired um, one of the country's finest antitrust litigators, uh, a tough-as-nails prosecutor uh, in the form of uh, Chancellor Joel Klein, uh, who you will meet uh, for lunch today, because then and now, uh, public education in this country, and I suspect in uh, many parts of the world, uh, is wrapped in a steep, vested adult interest, that is, the interest of the adults within the system, and the adults who have a personal interest in the system, I don't mean in the success of the system, I mean because their livelihoods or influence uh, is impacted by an organization such as this, that that vested adult interest resulted in a situation that was comfortable for those of us who worked in the system, uh, but not necessarily always in the best interests of the children who studied in it, which helps to explain in part why in a system where for over 50 years only half of the students were successful, teachers, principals, superintendents, chancellors were never replaced because students were not learning. Chancellors came and went, it seemed every two or three years, but for political reasons, not for accountability reasons around whether they had impacted policies that resulted in higher levels of student achievement. And in order to break through that vested adult interest, you needed someone with an eye to understand what it is um, to break through a public sector monopoly that is not designed in the best interests of the people it is serving. One of the first things we did, and it's uh, ironic to talk about this at Columbia University, but one of the first things that we did is we started our own principal training institute. And that was because we could not trust the universities in New York City. And whether you're from this city or not, you know that New York has some of the finest universities in the United States. But we could not trust the universities in this country to develop the kinds of school leaders who would make a difference in the lives of all of their children. In fact, the leaders who had graduated from those schools, and I count myself as one, I went to uh, graduate school uh, at that renowned institution on 120th Street, just up the block affiliated with this university. <laughs> uh, those colleges and universities did not prepare leaders who were able to take a critical eye to the work we were engaged in, who understood we were not wedded to the traditions and precedents of failure but that the charge was to educate not just some of the children to their highest levels and aptitudes, but all of the children. And so we began training our own principals. 
We also built on an initiative uh, led by uh, people like Michelle Cahill, uh, now of the Carnegie uh, Foundation, but uh, one of the Chancellor's earliest educational advisors, uh, and even prior to that, one of the founders of the small schools movement in New York. Um, we began closing large, low-performing schools and replacing them over time with new, smaller schools. That's a recurrent theme in the reforms that have taken place in New York. The people responsible for institutional failure don't have the capacity to reinvent themselves and their schools, neither the motivation nor the capacity. But you can start something entirely different. You can build it from the idea up around how best to educate kids. And over time, you can begin to shift the resources from the thing that um, did not work to now the new uh, institution that is effective. Over the last uh, five years, we've opened close to 500 new small schools. Um, and then the third and final major uh, part of the reform is we took the field organization that used to be organized into geographic um, uh, regional or superintendent's offices facing the central office. We dismantled it and we rebuilt it facing the schools. Uh, the money that was saved, which was about 80% of the cost of those organizations, went into school budgets. And those field organizations, now called networks, consist of 60 self-selected, self-governed networks of schools where the principals get to decide which other principals they want to network with, independent of the city's geography, um, at a cost of a tenth of what the old district and regional structure used to cost us, um, significantly raising the percentage of per capita uh, expenditures that went to direct instructional pur uh, purposes. The results now some eight uh, plus years later, for the first time in over half a century, the needle has moved from 50% to 63%. Statistically, that's a 27% increase which uh, by any measure is significant. However, the fact that we are now succeeding with two-thirds of our youngsters is no cause for celebration because when you analyze who gets to graduate, you find it is largely female, the graduates are largely white, they're largely Asian. If you take a look at who's not graduating, it is largely male, largely African-American, largely Latino. People familiar with the situation in New York knows the hard work is now ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, that will be the beginning of our conversation about uh, the reforms that Eric was so intimately involved with that were led by Mayor Bloomberg at the beginning of his administration. And I'm really glad you emphasized that graduation rate because that, in the end of the day, is, I think, one of the most important measures of change in New York City. Our second panelist, and I'm, I'm delighted to welcome him as well, is Danny Bargiora. He is the head of the Jerusalem Education Authority with oversight over the city's ultra-Orthodox education, Arab education in East Jerusalem, and the advancement of children at risk and several other municipal agencies. They gave you all the easy jobs, huh, Danny? Prior to his current position, uh, Danny Bargiora served as head of implementation of, new, of a New Horizon style school in Jerusalem, a, a, a very particular kind of reform in the Israeli educational system. He is a graduate of the Mandel School for Educational Leadership and later served as a principal also of the Charles E. Smith Jerusalem School of the Arts for 11 years. He's been awarded many prizes and uh, citations for the work he's done in Jerusalem. He holds a BA and an MA in math and computer sciences from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. 
and um, he spent five years of service in the Israeli Air Force. I hope you met our delegate from New Delhi. I think uh, there seems to be a pattern here. People moving into the from the military into our education systems, um, something that I hadn't noticed before, but clearly has some value in leadership and in promoting innovation and reform and understanding the diversity of populations uh, that we have to serve. It's a personal pleasure to we re really uh, welcome Danny Bargiora to our summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here. Just 10 minutes. <laughs> um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, this special meeting of sharing knowledge and experience throughout the world. And with your permission, I want to refer to one of the questions, the last question from the last panel about educating kids with uh, dyslexia. So I was one of those kids. And when I was a kid in the Israeli education system, there was no special treatment for those kids, like we heard happens nowadays in Finland. So I never had a chance uh, to learn English as a second language in a appropriate way. So now when you know the reason, you must forgive me for my English. Um, when I saw the topic of the summit, uh, innovation in teaching and learning, I remembered Another summit took place in the city of Beersheba in Israel a few years ago under the topic of innovation in parenthood. And uh, the mayor of the city uh, opened the summit like Mayor Bloomberg did this very morning. And uh, he said he don't know much about innovation in parenthood, but he can clearly remember when he was a child, when he get back home after a long day at school, and he found his mother in the kitchen and he opened the fridge and saw a beautiful apple shining and he wanted to grab the apple and his mother gently pushed him from the fridge saying this apple is for your father and then he grew up and got married and had a child of his own and when he came back home come back home after a long work day he found his wife in the kitchen and he opened the fridge and saying a beautiful apple and his wife pushing him gently from the fridge saying this apple is for the kid <laughs> so I think in the past we were all talking about the teacher and the teacher was in the center and then there was an era when we talked about the child and the child is in the center and I think that today when we realize that the process of teaching and learning should be in the center. The connection, the dialogue between the teacher and the child is the center. And I think this is the most truly innovation uh, of our area concerning education. And I was asked to speak, uh, to refer to the special uh, diversity population in the city of Jerusalem, which I'm in charge of. And uh, I want to refer to two kinds of diversities in the city. First of all, in Jerusalem, like in most other cities uh, in the world, I believe, we have great diversity uh, in classrooms. We can see immigrants and natives and kids from all backgrounds of socioeconomical and, uh, families. We have kids with special needs. We have dyslexic kids in the classrooms and because we believe uh, in enclosure in including the special education kids within normative school and within the normative classes we can find also special education kids in the classrooms so I believe though these kind of diversities happens in most places and I want to refer to two initiatives two um, innovations that took place in in Israel and in Jerusalem as well. One is the reform you mentioned that I had the, uh, the privilege to be ahead of her. It, it's implementation and the new horizon. Due to budget cuts through the last decades, what happens in 
the schools in Jerusalem that most hours, teaching hours, was in front of all class. There was less and less teaching hours, so the possibility of splitting the class into small groups were almost impossible. And we saw more and more teaching hours, frontal teaching hours in front of all classes, very crowded classes, averagely more than 30 kids in a classroom. So what we did, we, f we did a new wages agreement with the teacher union, and part of the agreement was that along with the traditional teaching hours in front of all classes, each teacher must teach five weekly hours in front of small groups, up to five kids. This is part of the wages agreement. They can be one up to five kids for five hours a week. So we forced the school to have many, many hours of almost personal teaching. Of course, this was a, 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 a side with guidance and, and, and helping the teacher to, to get into this world of, uh, of uh, particular teaching. And uh, of course, it helps us very much to relate to different types of kids, different types of learning uh, uh, needs of, uh, of the kids. So we have now many, many hours of small groups teaching, and that's a great way to help um, uh, special kids, uh, special education kids, special needs, and, and all kind of special and different needs of the kids. The second thing is, uh, is uh, technology, and uh, uh, we are closing the gaps of what kids see at home and what happens in school, laptops and, and, and computerized classrooms. And it's also a beautiful uh, opportunity for the teachers. We force the teacher to ask themselves what they are going to do now with this technology. And this, um, uh, we, what I've seen that in many, many schools, we see the teacher awakening from a long, uh, uh, with, uh, from uh, too many years they were sleeping and they uh, must ask themselves what they are doing now and a big change happens in schools now just because we put some technology or just because we force them to sit with five kids so they have to ask themselves what the hell I have to do with five kids. It's much easier to stand than to lecture in front of the whole class. But this is not uh, the, the, all of the, 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 the whole story of Jerusalem City. Uh, uh, we have another kind of diversity in Jerusalem which refer to languages and cultures and, and identities. And in the education system in Jerusalem, we actually have four different education systems. We have uh, the Arab education system, where the kids, the Palestinian kids of East Jerusalem are attending. They are learning according to the Palestinian uh, curriculum. The, and of course, the language is Arabic. We have the ultra-Orthodox education system, which learn mostly holy studies, like they used to learn 100 years ago. We have the modern Orthodox education system, and we have the secular education system. And those are completely se separate schools. I mean, you, don't, you can't see within one class ultra-Orthodox, Arab, modern Orthodox, or secular students they don't meet in classrooms, so it's our. It's a and, and the reason is, is a politic. This is a political reasons, not a pedagogical reasons. And um, when we realize that this is a political question, we understood that the only way to change it is bottom up, not from up down. So we encourage communities and school to find the ways to corrupt collaborate and to uh, and to meet each other and I can tell you we have some successes in Israel we have in Jerusalem we have uh, a bilingual school a Jewish Arab common school which I happen to be one of the founders of this school where kids Arabs and Jews are attending the same classroom and learning in the two languages equally and we have a few schools where uh, more than Orthodox and secular Jews are learning together. And um, this is also a um, very important uh, thing that happens in Jerusalem. 
of course, we are trying uh, to see how can we force those communities to meet, if not in schools and after school activities, and we are making a lot of efforts to, to try to build the bridges between those uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think everybody understands as we continue to hear from our panelists this morning um, how, how difficult it is to run complex multicultural urban school systems and, and how dedicated um, the people are who are doing this job today uh, all over the globe. It's my pleasure now to introduce our third panelist, Sin Kim Ho who is the Deputy Director of Educational Technology Division in the Ministry of Education for Singapore. Singapore, I'm sure most of you know here, has one of the most successful urban school systems uh, in the world. And uh, Sin Kim Ho oversees the team which provides consultancy services to all 355 Singapore schools in planning and implementing technology in teaching and learning. And this is uh, very important, as we know. The issues around technology are not just complicated, because sometimes the technology isn't the complicated part. It's uh, the substance and the content of what you put in in your technological systems. I had a professor in graduate school who used to say about computer programming, garbage in, garbage out. So if you put in high-level substance, you make all the difference in the world. And of course, that's something that's been going on in the Singapore school system, no small measure uh, due to Mr. Sin Kim Ho. During his career with the ministry, he took on roles as a secondary school teacher, understanding what goes on in the classroom. We're seeing a pattern here, obviously, of the great leaders of our urban school systems. They have experience teaching and learning. A physics lecturer in junior college, vice principal of Pasir Re Secondary School uh, before taking the helm as principal of the Greenview Secondary School in 2004. He also serves as chair of the governing board for InnoTech, the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Education, Innovation, and Technology based in the Philippines. It's a pleasure for me and for all of us to welcome you here to the summit today. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for the introduction. Good morning to all. I would like to thank the uh, Department of Education and New York City Global Partners for convening the Urban Education Summit in this beautiful cosmo cosmopolitan city. In fact, this morning, when I came in, I'm very pleasantly surprised to meet uh, quite some fellow Singaporeans, a few over here. Uh, Mr. Sun Chen Wei, who is also my colleague in the uh, Ministry of Headquarters, a visiting fellow in uh, Columbia University. And uh, one of my ex-students, when I began as a teacher, is also here uh, doing his master's in education. The theme for this panel is innovative teaching approaches. So I, I would like to share with you how Singapore schools harness technology to bring about innovations for teaching and learning. Before I start, it's useful to understand some brief background about Singapore. We are a small nation state with no natural resources, and so human capital is the most important thing we've got. Our government invests heavily in education, with spending of about 9.6, 9.7 billion Singapore dollars, or about 3.6 percent of our gross domestic product in the financial year 2010. The bulk of which goes to recruiting good teachers and paying the salaries. The McKinsey report in 2008 lauded Singapore for our emphasis on the quality of teachers. We have about 500. 1,000 students, 30,000 teachers, and 360 schools in our system. Technology plays an important role in our economy and our lives. Singapore has leveraged technology to overcome the limitations of a small population and multiply the value of services and products created by our workforce. We are one of the highest technology penetration in the world, with more than 140% 
mobile phones take up rate. That means we have people actually carrying two handphones. Likewise, technology has featured strongly in education. Singapore was the first country to embark on a systematic national master plan back in 1997 to introduce info communication technology or ICT by wiring every of our classroom with internet connections, computers and projectors. We also train all our teachers on how to integrate technology into the lessons and distributed teaching resources in CD-ROMs to every single school. Subsequently, in 2003, when all schools have at least some basic level of ICT provisioning, we decided to devolve funds to schools so that they can decide on choice of equipment and resources that will meet the particular learning needs of their own students. As a system, we deliberately encouraged every of our school to find its own niche area. We do not want schools to be just the same, but a rich diversity with a high base standard across the entire system so that we can cater to the different talents among our young and to ensure that every of our students has access to good quality education. In addition to professional development opportunities, more funding and support were given to schools embarking on experimentation. We facilitated collaborations with industry to develop innovative solutions for learning and organized collaborations, organized regular platforms for schools to collaborate and showcase and share their innovations with each other. As a result of our efforts, we witnessed a whole variety of innovative strategies emerging from our schools. Let me illustrate with a few examples. Juin and Rulang are neighborhood schools, primary schools, with structured robotic programs that are built systematically into the six-year education and experienced by every of the students. If you talk to the principals, they will proudly tell you about how the students' mathematics score have improved because learning to program robots uh, train actually the logical part of the mind. In Canberra Primary School, teachers work with industry to develop a surround immersive virtual environment where Singapore in the 19th century is recreated so that our students can relieve the history and give them some idea how their forefathers live. In Crescent Girls School, students learn using interactive digital textbooks, which allow both teachers and students to co-create and add on their own content. Students use it to collaborate with each other, conduct research, document their learning, and bring, about, and bring these materials back to the class for in-depth discussions. These are just some examples which are tip of the iceberg of the various levels of innovations taking place in our schools. If you do come to Singapore and visit our schools, principals and teachers will share with you with pride their own programs that have evolved on their own over the years. And all these are taking place not just in our best schools, but also in our neighbourhood schools. However, I would like to share one important point in technology implementation. Really, in all the innovations we see, my personal observation is that the quality of a student's learning when using technology is determined by one key factor, the pedagogical skills of our teachers. Technology does not automate learning. Neither does it make a bad teacher good. Classroom management issues do not disappear when you put teachers, students behind a computer. Rather, a good teacher, for a good teacher, technology is an enabler. Quality learning needs to be mediated by good teaching. A good teacher scaffolds students' learning online and provides guidance for students working in teams. A good teacher does not leave students to comment freely in blogs and forums. Rather, he or she sets online rules, probes students to think deeper, challenges students' assumptions, opens possibilities, just as one would do in a real classroom discussion. In conclusion, I would like to say that for all the technology innovations that we see in Singapore schools, one thing for sure is we still need teachers. And just like New York City, we need great teachers. So teachers, 
you'll never be out of a job, or at least for the next 50 <laughs> years or so, I can see. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for putting technology in perspective and helping us understand its role in teaching and learning. And I know the teachers out there very much appreciate uh, what you said. Our final panelist is Dr. Christopher Spence. Um, and it is a special pleasure to introduce him to all of you and to have him here with us in New York City. He is the Director of Education for the Toronto District School Board and a renowned educator and a dedicated community activist. And those two things can come together in a very powerful, professional, and effective presence in one person. And um, I really actually don't know too many people who can lay claim to all of those three activities at the same time. And you have been one of them, and I think you're an inspiration to a lot of people in this room today. Dr. Spence has more than 15 years as a senior administration in, in, in senior administration and teaching, and is also the author of several books. He played a significant role in the development of a number of successful initiatives, including Boys to Men, Project Girls Only, and the Read to Succeed program, which motivates and teaches boys to read. The success of these programs were featured in a documentary about his life, person to person, and in an article in the Reader's Digest titled, Man on a Mission. Dr. Spence, as I said, has won many awards, but for us in this room today, um, he's not just a hero on, st on stage and screen and in the books. He's actually been out there in our neighborhoods and in our schools doing the hard work that it takes to educate kids and understanding one size does not fit all and putting his money where his mouth is, working in the trenches with kids in the poorest communities and really showing that everyone can learn. Thank you for being with us today. I welcome you. Well, thank you. Um, I have to tell you, as I was uh, preparing for today, my 11-year-old daughter said, Dad, why are you always doing these presentations? You know what I told her? I, I do it because I like the introductions. So <laughs> I want to thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today, to be representing Canada and the Toronto District School Board. Uh, we are the largest school board in Canada. We have over 550 schools and uh, over 260,000 students. So last year what we did is we unveiled our vision of hope, which is really uh, inspired by the words of author Neil Postman who said, children are living messages that we send to a time we will not see. And the message that we have to send by way of our children is one of hope. Hope is what drives improvement and improving our schools and ultimately our students' life outcomes is what we're all hoping for for the future. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a laser-like focus on three priorities, student achievement, parent and community engagement, and financial stability. And within each of those priorities, we had uh, various uh, strategies going on uh, to move those agendas forward. So for example, under student achievement, we've developed a boys' education strategy. Uh, with, uh, Like many uh, districts, uh, we have some real concerns and challenges uh, with the achievement of our boys. We also developed a technology strategy because one of the things that we wanted to do is equip every learner for the digital age. Under our parent and community engagement uh, strategy, we've been working hard towards developing a, par a parent charter uh, with our parents. Uh, we've uh, piloted 16 full service schools uh, to really give our, our parents more op opportunity to access uh, schools in our community. And uh, we're also going to be launching uh, parent academies uh, in the new year. With regards to financial stability, one of the things that we had to do was we really had to come up with a five year capital plan which has really uh, had us to, uh, focus in on consolidating and uh, closing some of our schools. And this past year, we closed eight. Like uh, many other districts, we're also faced with the issue of declining enrollment. And at the Toronto District School Board, we lose approximately 4,000 students a year. And so part of our efforts have been to try to uh, certainly retain the students that we have, but attract new students to the board, and to also uh, re-engage some of those students that have been pushed out 
uh, through uh, uh, various uh, happenings in our school system. So one of the things that we did is we also hired uh, a marketing officer and uh, the marketing officer is coming up with a strategic plan to really support uh, some of those efforts. Now this year we're trying to go a little bit deeper. So we uh, introduce Vision of Hope 3.0 and uh, again it's a real opportunity for, for us to really be driven by collaboration, innovation and accelerating change. But uh, you know as a leader one of the things that I want to do is I want to lead with questions rather than solutions. And so the question that we keep asking is, what will it take? What will it take for every learner at the Toronto District School Board to walk the stage with dignity, purpose, and options? And I think we all recognize that we are living in a different world with profound demographic changes. Technology is no longer an option. It's an essential tool for learning. We've gone from chalkboards to smart boards. And when I talk to students, they tell me that they want to be creators. They can be a filmmaker on YouTube, a recording artist on Second Life, an opinion leader on all the blogs. But when they come into our schools, they have to power down. So we have to find a way to bring the 21st century into our schools. Because as you know, in the 21st century, the work is different, tools are different, communication is different, information is different, kids are different, learning is different. So teaching and learning must also be different. But when it's all said and done, we really do believe that all students really need three things to be successful. One is belief in their abilities to master a rigorous curriculum, and that with skilled and knowledgeable instruction in safe and caring environments, all students can be successful. Time tailored to specific student needs. Some students just need more time to grasp the concepts. And understanding that not all students learn the same way and at the same rate. You see, traditionally the student has always followed the teacher, but now more than ever we're asking the teacher to follow the student and build on what that student knows and can do. And we are well aware of the fact that the work that we do really is about social justice, which begins by gaining a passion for the plight of disadvantaged students. So we continually ask ourselves, who tends to be privileged? Who tends to be marginalized? How can we take action in the classroom and in our system to interrupt these cycles of oppression? As you know, one of our overarching goals as educators is to really prepare our students for what they're going to face when they leave us. And in the future, 75% of jobs will be in STEM, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's not just STEM careers, it's STEM in every job. So one of the things that we've launched is our project called STEAM, because part of that is that we also wanted to integrate the arts and know how important the arts are. And we've developed this fund where schools can now access funds for innovative, uh, innovative projects uh, with regards to STEAM. We are very concerned about the health and well-being of our students. And uh, so we've uh, launched the Directors Fit Initiative. And again, this just recognizes that obesity has now surpassed smoking as the number one health risk in North America. And when you talk to some of today's employers, they're fearful that today's students won't be healthy enough to be tomorrow's workers. So this initiative really gives us a laser-like focus on health and, and well-being and ensuring that every student in our system has the opportunity for 20 minutes of physical activity each and every day. Our Afrocentric school is another example of the work that we're doing and this, uh, for students in uh, JK to grade 5. And this school opened in the fall of 2009 to respond to the concerns that we had with our black students where we have a 40% dropout rate. And now, uh, after one year, it, it's safe to say that stu school, students in this school are thriving with a culturally relevant curriculum, increased parent engagement, and they were also doing very well, and again, this is just after one year, doing very well in the standardized uh, assessments. For example, 81% of students achieved at or above the provincial standard in math compared to 71 percent of other students at the Toronto District School Board. Another example of some of the innovation going on at the TDSB is the Oasis Skateboard Factory. Ironically, this program is not about the sport of skateboarding, it's about uh, entrepreneurship, design and business marketing of a unique product. It's the first TDSB school to offer all subjects with a skateboard and street focus. And as you can imagine, students are very engaged. And when you talk to the students, they talk about wanting to get up in the morning and go to school because they feel it's relevant to them and their areas of interest. Eastern Comet Collegiate 
is another uh, innovative uh, program uh, that's happening in our schools and perhaps uh, it's the only one in Canada where we have a late start uh, which is scientifically supported to provide an optimum uh, accommodation for the sleep and study needs particularly required by teenagers. So here at uh, Eastern Commerce they start their day at uh, 10 o'clock and they end at 4 o'clock and we've seen uh, uh, dramatic uh, decreases in absenteeism and uh, much more uh, student engagement. And the student perception of this program has been uh, very, very uh, positive. Triangle program is the only program of its kind in Canada, and it caters to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and spirited students. And just a couple of days ago, one of the things that we launched was a, a program where we're now going to train uh, teachers in every middle school and every se secondary school so that they can uh, be the champions for positive spaces uh, in their schools. And this uh, curriculum is uh, infused with queer issues into all courses in grade uh, 9 to 12. And uh, originally this actually did start as a stopgap program, but now it has become a destination because, as you know, students can't learn if they don't feel safe. And many of our students were being pushed out of their local schools because of safety concerns. All of these programs are just reminders that our job is to teach the kids that we have, not the kids that we used to have, not the kids that we wish we had, not the kids who exist only in our dreams. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there are questions, please step forward to the mics in the front of the room. Why don't we start? I would like to address this question to uh, all Could you identify oh, yourself sorry. first, please? Alan I'm Bain, sorry. American Scottish Foundation. Uh, I'd like to ask what the panelists feel is the role of sport in education. In my era, it was very much part and parcel of my growing up, development of values, etc. You want to take that? Could, could I, I'll Chris, respond to that, as, uh, take that. as a former uh, professional athlete, uh, I think uh, sport plays a, a critical role. Um, I think it uh, provides opportunities to, to learn about uh, life. Um, I, I know that uh, w when I talk a little bit about, you know, why I'm doing what I get to do today, um, two factors come up. One is certainly the support that I had for my family, uh, but the other is the uh, opportunity to uh, participate in a sports culture where I learned, you know, self-discipline, uh, teamwork, and all of those, uh, I think, uh, skills that, that uh, hopefully can be transferred to other areas of your life. So I think sport's a, a big part of, um, of, of helping to uh, develop uh, quality uh, character uh, students. And one of the things that we're looking at uh, over the next couple uh, months is to uh, actually develop a sports academy that will really embrace some of those principles and, uh, uh, you know, encourage and uh, engage students in learning. Thank you. We'll take a next question. Claire Sylvan uh, from International Network for Public Schools. Um, and I want to ask uh, all the panelists, um, Eric, you can choose to answer or not because Eric and I, full disclosure, have a long relationship. I worked at International High School at LaGuardia. I'm interested in how you are all dealing with um, immigrants to your countries and students who are learners of second languages and what innovations you are instituting um, across the board for that group of students as well as the um, incredible innovations that I've heard all of you mention already. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start with Danny uh, Bargiora and then we'll take a comment from anybody else who wants to comment on this. So as I, as I, mes as I mentioned before, we have many new immigrants, newcomers to Israel from very various kind of languages and country and cultures and uh, we have many immigrants from Ethiopia and um, because we don't want, we want them to be an integrated part of our system, of our schools and classroom because I, we think this will help them to, to find their pl place in the society. Along with that we should uh, help them individually for their needs. So what we are doing, we are finding um, a balance between 
how many hours they can be within the classroom with the group ex for example for sport class and 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 we take them out uh, uh, to help them close the gaps uh, um, and we do it now with those uh, hours I mentioned before that we have now many in, in, in schools of working with small groups so we can take them and help them individually to close the gap. But it is very important that they will be part of the society, part of the school, and not in different classrooms and not in different schools, of course. Uh, Eric will be next. Yeah, well, you know, for 25 years in, uh, in New York, we spent our time debating what language the teachers should speak, whether the teacher should be speaking uh, the language of the child or, um, or English. And uh, Claire, as you know, at International High School and uh, uh, now the International High Schools in New York, uh, what we learned uh, some time ago is as the pedagogy improves, as more time is spent giving the students the opportunity to speak both English and their native language with each other in small collaborative groups working on real projects together, uh, the, the faster they acquire English and their uh, academic skills improve. Um, interestingly, uh, at the start of this administration in 2002, uh, the graduation rate for English language learners was about 30 uh, percent. During the initial stages of the reform, uh, it dipped to 25 percent. It was moving in the wrong direction. But I'm pleased to say in the last two years, as many of our small schools have begun serving more and more um, English language learners, and because the pedagogy in classrooms in small schools um, relies more on small group collaborative learning than the frontal teaching that we heard described earlier, uh, the graduation rate for English language learners has gone up 14 percent uh, in the last two years alone, and I expect it will continue. Sin Kim Ho, please. Yeah, maybe I'd just like to respond to both questions uh, very quickly. Um, we do have immigration, uh, immigrant, immigrants coming to Singapore to study, and people without um, uh, um, good, adequate knowledge of uh, use of English background. Um, and what we found uh, as, a, uh, as a school leader personally, it's very important for the child to also want to use it outside the context of the classroom. So even in the Ministry of Education provided funds for schools to conduct extra after school uh, courses and all that to prepare uh, students who have additional needs to learn the English language. English doesn't come as a natural language for us. We are not all native speakers, uh, but we do use it to, in, as a business language and uh, language that we use for teaching and learning in our schools. Uh, pertaining to the area of sports in education, um, uh, it's my personal belief that really um, Sports is something very important, which is not just about physical development. Uh, recent, uh, I think, uh, neuro neuroscience research and have shown that when students are active physically, it also increases their cognitive ability and skills. And that, in, in our own study of uh, students' uh, academic grades, achievement, and correlation with um, the, 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 the size and obesity rate, there is a certain uh, correlation that we see. So in fact, we are also strengthening our uh, physical education. We are creating a new center academy for uh, teachers, P, uh, physical education teachers to come together to share and collaborate and uh, uh, innovate on uh, good teaching practices in Singapore. Thank you. I'm going to ask our next two questioners to be the last two questioners and just one right after another provide the questions. And then I'll ask our panelists each to take one of those questions and respond. Hi, my name is Rafael Parente. I'm a subsecretary of education in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And uh, it's been very inspiring to be here and to listen to uh, everything that you all have been doing in your countries. And my question regards uh, ICTs, information and communication technologies, and if we shouldn't be uh, trying to be uh, more innovative in terms of uh, uh, disruption, disruption innovations in our schools too, thinking more outside the box and thinking if we really still need to work only within classrooms, if we can't teach everywhere all the time, if we can't uh, uh, let students learn autonomously and have other students be teachers as well, if uh, 
you have been doing anything in terms of that and thinking about new roles of the school, new places of learning, new roles for teachers, teachers not being the center of learning but um, stimulating students other than thinking of them as uh, uh, owners of knowledge and um, if we can talk or if you can tell me everything that you're doing right now, I would like to talk to you later on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Last question. Hello, my name is Irie Justenet, and I'm a program director for the International Youth Leadership Institute. Um, pretty much what a lot of the schools, high, we work with high school students, and a lot of the requirements for high school is to complete a component of community service. And it's also a requirement for our program in order for the students to travel. We have um, summer fellowship programs in Africa and Latin America every summer for about a month. And so I'm just curious to know what type of um, initiatives with as far as technology is concerned are you working with or have worked with for community service development projects? Thank you. Um, why don't we start with Chris and work our way down just to respond to one of one of the questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about what we're doing with this uh, Vision of Hope uh, 3.0 because I think it kind of uh, addresses your question and, and, and part of this shift that we're trying to make in the board is you know one from we've gone from old school and, and this whole belief that teaching has to occur under one roof uh, to the new school where teaching occurs anywhere, anytime, uh, where the teacher is now moving from the knowledge giver to the knowledge facilitator, um, where you're getting uh, students you know to to uh, be more a part of uh, the learning uh, process, and I think that you know that requires a real uh, shift in thinking. And uh, it's certainly something that uh, we're working towards because one of the things that we say is that we're not trying to prepare our students to be uh, uh, contestants on Jeopardy. We're preparing them to be productive uh, members of society. Uh, so trying to shift that paradigm is something that we're really trying to focus in on. Um, I, I didn't have time to share just now. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, embarked on two phases of master plan, and this, we are right now in the midst of our third master plan, which is uh, which started in 2009. Uh, our vision for the third ICT master plan is to uh, engage our students to use ICT for self-directed and collaborative learning. What we mean by that is that we really want our teachers to look to delve deeper into the pedagogy that enables our students to acquire skills, to co-create knowledge, to, have, to take ownership of the learning, monitor their own learning. And this re requires a whole set of pedagogies to shift attention from the teachers to the students. And uh, part of our strategy to doing, to doing that is really to see is to believe. Uh, we train, uh, my, my, my particular branch train uh, teachers in the schools to be mentors for other schools. So we role model for them in the training how technology is harnessed to uh, enable collaborative learning by, by, by between groups of teachers in, in their own uh, uh, learning groups. And uh, they go back to school and they mentor and show and demonstrate to other teachers how such uh, pedagogies can uh, be uh, applied in the classrooms. I just want to add one thing. We, are be we believe in, uh, in, in school autonomy with creative principles. I think those issues should rise from bottom up. Um, so we're looking for very creative principles. We are giving them uh, the resources and a uh, high degree of freedom and auto autonomy and beautiful things rise from, from experiences in the field. But uh, generally, the schools are very conservative, and uh, to change it, and I'm not sure it's, it's the right way to change it widely. It should give the grassroots that good ideas will, will, will come out, and, and then we will see, because I don't think there is only one correct answer for that uh, today. Thank you. Eric? You know, I, I don't want to give short, short shrift to the service question because there's uh, no doubt that um, engaging even the youngest uh, students in uh, service activities outside the school where they learn that at whatever age they have substantive contributions to make the society is an important part of, of what we ought to be doing with kids. But I too will uh, uh, address my closing remarks to the out of the box question. Uh, at times in my career, I've been accused of not only being out of the box, but somewhere between out of the box and out of my mind. <laughs> and uh, this, may, this may be part of it, but, um, you know, we heard that great education, um, as we've currently constructed it, rests on a great teacher in every classroom, and none of us have ever delivered a great teacher 
uh, in every classroom. Uh, so I think it's an interim step uh, breaking out of teacher isolation uh, to work toward models of uh, small teams of teachers responsible and accountable for manageable numbers of kids uh, is an important transition. But in the final analysis, the most important question I think any of us can ask ourselves at this stage of educational enlightenment about what schools ought to look like is what would school look like if it were built around the needs of a single kid? And then once you think you've got an answer to that question, how would you build that out for all kids? Uh, and if you think about that question for a while, it, it would need to look radically different from what we do today, the way um, we um, uh, restrain and restrict teachers to the tyranny of a kind of daily class schedule so that they don't have time to deal with the needs of students, uh, the way students move along the conveyor belt of class after class that has nothing to do with the hour before or uh, the one that comes next, uh, a legacy of a 19th century factory model. Uh, the one place in the world where I think uh, they are furthest advanced at asking this question uh, is an outfit called Kunskapskolen, K-U-N-S-K-A-P-S-S-K-O-L-A-N in Finland. It's a for-profit charter school organization uh, and they're uh, designing their own schools that don't include classrooms but that are built around what we've previously considered enrichment but is now at the heart of their educational uh, program. Thank you. What an extraordinary panel. What a set of extraordinary panelists. Um, this really brings to an end the public part of our summit this morning. I think we've heard a lot about the challenges that our global cities are facing uh, in, in educating their children. But, uh, but I actually feel very energized this morning and very optimistic as the world schools continue to attract dedicated and innovative educators, as we've seen here today, we will succeed in our mission to provide every child around the globe with a quality public education. Thank you for being with us today. And for those of you who are joining us for lunch, uh, please come forward. And we have handicap access for any of you who need that. Um, Thanks again. Thank you.